we're gonna get into Dr. Shafali's real, authentic, unapologetic answers to my questions that I pose to all of my guests at the end of my episodes on Mama Stay. So, welcome to the mic once again, the gorgeous, the fabulous, the brilliant, my girl, and yours, Dr. Shafali. Welcome to Mama Stay with Tanika Ray. How are you, Mama? I am so excited to be having this conversation with you. I'm really doing well. Thank you. Yes, I, you know, as much as the world is crazy, we have to all be concerned with our own well being. And that's all that kind of matters right now is to sort of illuminate light and our joy and our contentment and hope that it spreads. That's how it works, right? Right. I mean, the world is really going through uh, an inordinate amount of suffering, but we can only help, if at all, uh, if we are, as you said, filled with light and abundance and love. What good would it be if we are in so much suffering that we can't even shed light, right? So we have to own whatever little happiness or joy we can hold on to and kind of spread that. So I'm so happy that we're having this conversation. This is why I resonate with you so much because as you know, and I've told you this story, I talk about conscious parenting so much. This is over 20 episodes long, Mama's Day has been in existence. And almost every single episode we refer back to conscious parenting. My style is I am very influenced by a lot of moms I see on social media. I reach out to them. We become friends and then they become guests on my show. And every single time these people are holding courses on how to be kinder, gentler parents. And every single time, once we get to the end, it's my greatest inspiration is Dr. Shafali. All of them say it, all of them. So I am wow. so grateful that I have you on a text that I can call you. And I didn't know what you were going to th think about me doing a podcast yet, but I am so, so, so beyond grateful that you're here. And I want to dive into why you started leaning out of your business, your practice, and realizing that you needed to share your jewels with the world on parenting. Let's start there. Lay the groundwork for us. You were, you had a thriving practice. Yes, yes. So in my early 20s, I was really into meditation and began a practice that really allowed me to go deep into Buddhist principles and understanding. And my worldview changed. I began to understand that we were mostly living in false self, that our minds were heavily conditioned by the matrix or culture. So at a very young age, at 21, my entire world was getting combusted. And at the same time, I was studying psychology. I had just come to America. So I was just revolutionizing myself. You know, when you leave your country at a young age, uh, the possibility for your entire existence to undergo a deep metamorphosis is huge. Of course, some people can stay the same, but the potential is great when you leave your home country at a young age. Uh, and that's why I advocate that so much for young adults. So my entire worldview changed and I was a real novice seeking a new existence. So I was ripe for uh, growth, for transformation, for uh, deep change. And studying psychology at the same time allowed me to see how our family patterns influence our childhood in such a impenetrable way, in a way that is indelible. You can barely reverse the effects of childhood. You're constantly you know, striving to cope with those uh, childhood experiences, but it's really hard to reverse them. So the two influences, my Buddhist Eastern spirituality and my Western psychological training began to become integrated. And I began practicing as, a, as an East-West psychologist, but then when I became a parent and I encountered the force of my child's <laughs> essence and spirit, and found that I was no match for it. You know, you have a really strong willed daughter too. And yes. I was like, I was like cotton and she was like steel. <laughs> I was like up for a ride, right? And, and I didn't yeah. know how to manage it. I, all I knew was to yell and scream and lose my temper because that's all the current parenting paradigm teaches us that you need to be in charge, you yeah. need to be in control and you have all the leeway to punish your kid. 
So that's what I did. But it didn't feel good to me. And you know, it went against my, my Buddhist meditation practice. Mm -hmm. So I encountered for the first time around my daughter's third birthday, a deep depression, you know, like, I don't know how to do this thing. All I know how to do is lose my temper and it doesn't work. And not only am I killing my child's essence, I'm killing my own. Um, and that's when it hit me that I was operating out of my family childhood patterns and my ego. And that's when everything became crystal clear. I had epiphany after epiphany and the realization that if I was in ego, then surely every other parent is in ego too. Totally. But how, to, but how can I write about it? Because our egos are so fragile. You know, no one is more defensive than the parent including mm. myself. I was upset with myself that I was telling myself it was my ego. I so wanted to blame my partner or my kid. But so I was in deep conflict, you know, how can I own this and make other parents own it? So then I wrote my book, The Conscious Parent, and I thought it would be, you know, read by maybe just my neighbor. But no way. I, at first, I thought that no one would read it for sure. And, and for a good two years, no one, like maybe 20 people read it. So it took time to get out there because it was such a counterintuitive message. You know, most of the books on parenting were about how to fix the kid or how to raise the perfect child. And my book, I think one of the first books, seminal books, to really talk about raising the child can only occur after the parent raises themselves. One billion so that's percent. The journey. That's, the, that's the journey. I'm just going to get my coffee. No worries. That is an important journey because you touched on so many really great things, which is we are taught, taught as a society that it's always the kid's fault. We mm -hmm. are sort of parenting from inertia to a certain degree. I Things happen where my daughter, Steele, tests cotton, and I react in a way that I don't even know where it came from, but it is literally habitually what I heard as a child. So when I was steel and my mom was cotton, I'm just repeating the pattern. And so once we realize it, once you realize it, you have to stop it. Or then you're just consciously sending your child down the same road you were sent down, down. And then you're responsible. You're not taking accountability, right? Right, but it takes great courage and warriorship to look at your reflection in the mirror and, and admit and own that I am simply robotically, unconsciously repeating my childhood patterns. That is not for the faint-hearted. That takes a huge act of ownership, accountability, honesty, and a brutal co-creation of, you know, understanding your brutal co-creation in the process. Um, but like you said, culture doesn't train parents to take accountability. Parents are given the full permission and leeway to be traditional, hierarchical, tyrannical, and yep. abusive, and abusive to yeah. their kids. A hundred percent. So now that we are, and it does require a spiritual awakening at some point, because yes, I yes. love how you mentioned you came to this country as a young girl. And when you come to this country and you become a citizen of this country, you have to pass a lot of tests. You get indoctrinated to the ways of this country. So for you to have the wherewithal to go, wait a minute, um, there's something not right here. And I need to look beyond what I'm being not only taught back in India, but what I'm being taught here in America and say, there might be a different way. And that's where we are as a culture all over this world. Everything that we've been taught, and that's why I'm so obsessed with radical awakening as well, because you're tying all these pieces together. It's not just one column, it's multiple columns that form a group, isn't it? And I always say we either mother how we were mothered or we have a radical awakening and have to find another way to do it. And that is not easy to do. Absolutely. And really, it takes uh, the mentality and the mindset of beginning at ground zero, of having the beginner's mind as the meditators talk about. And truly, like you said, my book is called, my last book, A Radical Awakening, having a radical awakening. But what does that mean? That means mm -hmm. one is willing to journey through this life with the understanding that our traditional childhood conditioning 
needs to be questioned, challenged, stripped, and uh, abandoned if need be. Now, most of us cannot do that because we have so bought into the conditioning. We have been so brainwashed that the to even fathom the idea that it's all been a lie is so egregiously assaulting to our soul <laughs> that, that we, we just can't do it, right? My first epiphany at the age of 21 was around a lie. You know, I was on a bus and two gay women were in front of me, sitting on the seat in front of me, and they were all into each other and loving each other quite flamboyantly and lovingly. And I, as a 21-year-old recent immigrant from India who had been told that homosexuality is a taboo back then, this is 93, and I came from India, so mm -hmm. it was like the 50s, I was just <laughs> fascinated by these two lovers. And all I saw was love. And immediately there, there was a, a clash of my conditioning and what I saw. What I saw was beauty, love, freedom, mm -hmm. and, and pure joy. What I had been told was that this is wrong, this is evil, this is, uh, you know, a, a blasphemy. Now my two worlds collided. Now I had a choice. Do I dare to venture into the new world of the new terrain of, of beauty and love and see the truth? as it was appearing before my eyes? Or was I going to simply be a slave to my old patterning? And it's that nexus, it's that choice point that kills us because it splits us apart. I felt myself being torn asunder. And it happens at many points in our lives, right? Should I go with my authentic truth or should I follow the career that my parents set out for me? Do I go with my own sexuality or do I go with culture's mainstream sexuality? At every juncture, we are offered a choice. And taking the road less beaten is a really tough choice. And, and most people fall apart at that nexus because the ostracism is too severe, the, the, the fear that you will not be valid, that you will not be loved by your tribe, your old tribe, is too great a fear to encounter. You know, people cannot believe that there is a new tribe beyond the old tribe. Right. And there's so right. much comfort in the same and doing what everybody told you to do. I, I thank God every single day, Dr. Shafali, that God made me a natural born rebel. God put me in circumstances where I may have been the only black child in a school of white kids where I knew I was never going to fit in. So I always knew I had to find my own way. And so I know that that was almost a gift, even though at the time it was so painful. It's my greatest gift because I can tell people there is a tribe beyond the tribe you think is the only one that exists. And so if we can just step out of what the inertia is, what the regular old schmegler, what we are told over and over is going to keep us safe, we have to believe there's safety outside of that. One that we can be the mistresses of our destiny over, the ones that we can carve ourselves. But you're right. That's scary. You take one step and you're like, now where? And so I always tell people. Go to conscious parenting. That's the greatest first step you can take. And from right. there, the whole world opens. Right, right. And that's why I write the books I do. And you've come to my conference, Evolve. And that is the, a space for seekers, for people to come together who are willing to step outside the norm, the tradition, the conventional, and explore their identity outside of their conditioning. You see, we most of us live robotically tethered to the conditioning that we inherited. We don't question the existence of those traditions, be it religion, mm -hmm. be it education, be it sexuality. We, we feel so afraid that if we are not that identity, we are nothing. And what you learn in Eastern spirituality is that we are nothing and that the identity was a falsity. So coming back home in Eastern spirituality means coming back to your nothingness. And the mm. identity that you thought you had was a lie. So once you develop a different way of looking at your so-called self, then you're not afraid anymore because you realize that, oh, my attachment, my old attachments, those were the lie. Those were the nooses around my neck. And those yes. are the ones that are stifling my authenticity. The nothingness that I experience now that is terrifying to me is actually my home. And if I can learn to be okay in the nothingness, then I'm actually going to be liberated. Ooh, 
I have goosebumps because what people don't understand is that nothingness, the reverse side of that is the everythingness. You have to be willing to look at the nothingness in order to receive the everythingness, right? Correct, correct. So when you meet someone, like say you're meeting a, a new friend or a lover, and if you come packaged, all tightly packaged, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat and I'm black and I'm Jewish and I'm this and I'm that. Now your circle of of potential matching becomes lesser and lesser, right? So we don't realize that these identities actually enslave us and constrict us. Nothingness feels scary, but nothingness is emptiness and emptiness is everythingness, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the greatest potential when you are not tethered to a label, to an identity, when you're like, I don't know who I am and who are you and let's find out and let's play together in this infinite matrix of possibility instead of defining ourselves and now ostracizing each other, right? Imagine if somebody met you today and came to you and said, you know what? I am a a staunch Muslim or I'm a staunch Jew or Hindu, whatever, it doesn't matter. But you're not. Now we've created separation, right? So labels and identities create separation, but people don't realize it because that's how they were brought up. and, And they're just conditioned by that. Yeah, we're learning now, we have the language for it, that these race and, and, and religion and all these identities are constructs that are created to, quite frankly, to separate us. So I love that you said that. Now, you're having this journey to embrace the nothingness slash everythingness, and you have a daughter at the same time. How did you yes. incorporate this into a young mind so that she can understand and you guys can share a new language together so that you can have more um, compatible rearing of your child so that you aren't going to the screaming zone and feeling frustrated and your daughter feels safe and supported and doesn't need to feel like she needs to melt down at the same time. Do you understand what I'm asking? Sure, sure, sure. Like how do you not lose your shit in this crazy world? And that part in a way that feels feel, feels authentic. Yeah. You know, so the first thing I did uh, once I realized that I was an ego was I began a very intense journey of self-reflection, which is continuing to this day. Every Never day. Ends. There's yeah. every day. There's no destination. There's no perfection. It's constant self-searching, self-reflection and self-growth. My daughter is now 19 and I, I still am as clueless as I was when she was two because, because I am in beginner's mind every single day. Every single day, I don't know who she is. I'm checking in, like, who are you today? <laughs> because they're constantly evolving and I'm co- constantly evolving. So the first step in conscious parenting is to understand that you got to raise yourself. You got to move from your lack based beliefs, belief systems to abundance. You got to Mm. next, you got to set aside your fantasies, expectations and the movie you had created for how this childhood would be, how your child would be. And you got to release that. You got to understand that your child is not a mirror of you and your child Mm. is not here to fulfill your destiny. Your child is an autonomous being here to make her own mistakes or his own mistakes and to discover who it is they are. And maybe that path will look completely contrary to what you imagined, what you expected or what you feel you were entitled to. You know, I used to always look at my neighbors and, you know, be envious. Oh, how do they have the good, obedient child? Right. (laughs) Because every parent, every parent feels like they got the monster child, you know. Yeah. And but it's not true. Every child comes with challenges because they're human beings. But we somehow thought we were going to raise puppets. You know, I certainly thought it's going to be easy. I never realized how incredibly difficult it is to raise a human being. But not only that, to raise a human being consciously. Conscious parenting mm-hmm. is bloody tough because yeah. you are allowing the child to follow their voice to a certain degree. It doesn't mean it's a free for all, you know. Many people think that I'm advocating that they smoke crack cocaine at the age of four, you know. <laughs> no, it's, it's you know, because people are so silly, right? They're like, right. oh, are you saying that she can just, you know, get on drugs and be an alcoholic? No, I'm not saying that. I, what, I'm, what I am saying is that the parent understand and observe and become aware and very vigilant of their mm-hmm. egoic projections and their egoic expectations of their children. And that takes a lot of self-search and a lot of self-ownership 
right? So when you, when you enroll your kid in piano, for example, you have to question, am I doing this because it's my ego or am I doing it because my kid is showing some interest? <laughs> you know, and most of the time it's because it's my ego. And so in yeah. little and, prof and profound ways, when we yell at our kid, are we yelling at our kid because it's truly a behavior worthy of yelling? Or are we yelling at our kid because the kid is making us feel so helpless and so incompetent that that infuriates us? Right. So these are the questions you begin to ask as you go on this journey of inward reflection and growth and you release your child. So how I did it is when I understood that my child was not my instrument for me to feel better about myself, then I released her wild and crazy hair. I saw you do a, <laughs> a, 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 a video recently about doing your daughter's hair and how you need to get into a state of Zen and give it two hours. But, but you know that you come to her hair with anxiety. Why? Because you want control. You want to control her wild hair. And I used to want to control my daughter's wild hair too. Till I realized I'm a fool. Like this is not a thing to control. Like hair is meant to be wild. And yes. her hair is meant to be wild. So why are we trying to control it? Because in our vision, we like this neatly packaged person that looks cute and reflects our desire to be cute and accepted. And once we go to the shadow place of our, our need, then maybe we can let go of the control. In ways like this, we begin to see how our desire to control our children is disguised as care and love, but it's really control. You know? I was going to say that so much of our ideology isn't even our own. So much of it has been placed there from our parents, our grandparents, our aunties. So yes, I, as much as I, I'm trying not to stick to my construct, in the black culture, you keep that hair control, but you see, I've never, I've never done that to mine. So why would I feel out of control when my daughter is just expressing her hair the same way? And so, yes, we have to, conscious parenting requires you to be present, to be observant, to be intentional every second of the day. There is no autopiloting in conscious parenting. And that's the part that's really hard for people. They're like, oh, it's so hard. Can I just tell them to do what I want them to do? You could, but that's not going to help your cause ultimately. Now, now here's the thing. Your daughter's 18, 19, 19. So at some point, is there, a, does she ex, go off into the sunset? Does she get thrown out of the, out of the nest where she can handle all of it deftly, brilliantly without you constantly having to remind her of who she is and to keep her attached to the consciousness? Is there a nice. moment where you go, you're good? Yeah, I think I was good at like when she was 12 because I was shoved out of her, her, her internal home. She threw me out. I, I write in one of my books that around the age of 12, uh, she told my then husband and I that we were irrelevant. And I was just so happy she even knew what the word meant. And my... my but my ex-husband was all in his ego and he was like, how rude she is and how dare she call us irrelevant. So I was like, oh, maybe it is rude. Maybe that's not what a 12 year old should say. I was in a conflict, you know, between the unconscious right. part of me and the conscious part of me. But then I realized we should be irrelevant. What that means is that she's taking ownership of her own sovereign inner terrain. And as much as I don't like it, that's my ego. I, we should be in supporting casts increasingly as they grow older. And then soon we should not even show up for the rehearsal, right? We shouldn't even show up for the show because if we're invited and we are worthy of it, then we can take a seat in the audience. But as our kids grow older, they should take greater and greater ownership of their lives. We should be irrelevant because that means that they can think for themselves and own some decisions as their age demands, right? So my goal as a conscious parent wasn't necessarily that I never lose my temper because that's asking too much. Really, it's just asking too much. Right. But my goal was twofold. Number one, let me recognize who my child is versus who I wanted my child to be. So right there to go through a big death and a mourning mm -hmm. and a grieving, but also a celebration. 
you know, that, yeah, my child is nothing like what I imagined, but that's something to celebrate. That's so wonderful. So I had to grow into that, that this unique being has her own essence and it's nothing like what I thought. But as much as I can mourn that death of my old fantasy, I can also celebrate this being for who they are. And the second mm -hmm. uh, task I gave myself was, how can I be a custodian of my child's essence, even though it doesn't look like what I want? How can I be her guide and her support system? And once we understand that that's really all we're here to do, that we're just here to be our child's spiritual custodians, then we will reduce our ego, become humble, take a backstage and just kind of, you know, back off a little bit because otherwise our egos are out of control. We think we own our children. They owe us their allegiance. They owe us their honesty and veracity. They don't owe us anything. They don't, and we don't own them. So we have to really adjust in the way we're thinking and traditional parenting, like you said, we've been taught to be control freaks, to be power mongers, to be tyrannical, to be hierarchical. We've been taught that parents need to, you know, put our kids into shape. And then the opposite, what parents say, if we don't let them ha be, have full control, you know what they say? Oh, okay, then I won't give a shit, right? Like that's not oh. an option either, right? That's not an option, right? Then they just wanna release their children to the wolves. That's mm -hmm. not an option either. You cannot be done with parenting, sorry. Now you had the kid, you kinda gotta be there through the thick and thin of it. And that it's torture. And no one told us that this is for life. I didn't know that this continues on and on and on, but it does. Forever. Yes. Forever, <laughs> apparently forever. So it's a life sentence. You can't divorce these children. So you find a middle ground. And the middle ground, the beautiful path is the conscious path where you don't burn out because you don't over control and you don't overproduce and you know your role and you know your place and you allow it to unfold and then you have fun with it because it's an adventure. It's not about right. perfection. It's about exploration. That's why I wanted to create this community because it's for women who are raising their babies consciously. We're finding new ways of breaking generational traumas and we need a community where we see each other, right? Where we're saying, I support you. How are you doing it? What books are you reading? And it's a really beautiful place. And I have to tell you, you know, I've talked to you about this, how my mom and I, we still are kind of two separate people. And she did that my whole life. If I didn't do it her way, then I'm done. I'm done. You do whatever you want. You do whatever. So I grew up never considering her, never needing her, never advising, um, never needing her advice and never telling her what I was doing. And now that I've, I'm a grown woman and I've had some successes, she feels a certain way, but she bowed out. So I don't need her. There's no part of me that even thinks of her when I'm going through life, which is damaging. And I say this to my daughter, and I don't know what you're going to think about this, but I say to her, when we have those explosions, because my baby's an Aries rising, oh, goodness gracious. When we have these volcanic explosions, she goes away, I go away. And my daughter, she's so beautifully ahead of her time that she'll say, mommy, I'm really sorry. I was just upset because I really was mad about this. And then we can come to the table and have like almost a mature conversation about the explosion. And I say to her, I really don't want what happened to me and Grammy to happen to us. So let's continue to talk. And I don't even know if that's too much for her, but she seems to understand it. And it's giving her a marker because at age six, she came to me and she said, mommy, why don't you and Grammy hug? And I said, we just aren't that way. She goes, I hope we always hug. And I go, me too. So to give her that much information might be looked down upon, but I think it's important for her to know, I hope that we stay tight, that we can have these honest conversations, that we can continue to grow through conscious parenting forever. Yeah, it's more importantly, it's that you are working on your sense of being abandoned by your mother, of being let go of. I mean, that's really hard for a kid. And you've yeah. healed or are healing that. So you don't use your kid in a manipulative way to fill your, mm -hmm. your inner wound. And as long as you, you're working on your issues, that's the only thing that matters. Then you won't pass it on unconsciously. And, uh, you know, that's a lot for you to have dealt with. You know, it's such 
a, a power trip that parents do. You know, if you don't follow my way, then I'm going to disapprove of you. And that conditionality children pick up on and they sense it. You don't have to say it. They sense it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they withdraw from you because they feel afraid of your disapproval or your rejection. And that's what you did. You stopped telling her because you didn't want to be rejected. Yeah, it's a very it's a very slippery slope. And I love that even though I love that you're so honest about your daughter, you and your daughter still have to work through some stuff because I, I listen to Lisa Nichols and Iyana Van Zant and you, and it's, it's, I can't believe in anybody's testimony unless they've been tested. And so for you to be so honest about that just speaks volumes. What are you and your daughter working on now? Um, you know, I think what we're working on now is, you know, I think I'm like the teenager and she's the parent, meaning, you know, now that I'm single and I'm, I've let go of my ex, she is like, she is the one who is controlling, you know, because she is, <laughs> but, but that's normal, you know, like she's possessive of me. And I've worked on my issues of letting go f for years now, you know, so I have released mm. her. You know, I allow her to have any kind of relationship, straight, not straight, bisexual. I mean, I encourage all sorts of things wow. for her, but she's so conservative towards me. She's like, <laughs> you, you will not date. You will do this. You will do that. But I understand that it's her need to have control. It's her need mm -hmm. to feel safe. So, you know, conscious parenting teaches you so much. It's taught me so much that yeah it, it you know i i so appreciate where she comes from and i try to not take it personally but when you understand that your child is always expressing a need underneath their behavior then you can have compassion so my daughter and i are just yeah. working on that she's adjusting to the fact that her mother is a woman and she doesn't see me as a woman you know she sees me <laughs> as a as a, a chauffeur a driver right. a, a, a wallet you know a bank account mm -hmm. And, and just her gra her grandma mom, you know, like who's supposed to be matronly and never have any desires. So poor thing, she's having to adjust to the fact that, oh, maybe my mom is a woman who has needs, right? That's yes. very hard for her right now. So, but, but in terms of what I'm dealing with with my 19 year old is just utter awe, celebration. I'm just mm. amazed that she can be on her own. She's at college now. I, I have completely released her. So I'm just so excited to watch a young adult grow and take wings. You, you're going to see it's if you do the work and prepare for that, that phase of dropping them off to college is just mind blowing. Watching her do her own laundry, watching her negotiate bills or, or landlords or, you know, conflict, you know, it's just it's just so awe inspiring that you see that, wow, they're capable. And I don't need yeah. to be hovering around them, you know, and um, not calling her for days and letting her be an adult in her own way. It's just an amazing process. But many parents are not prepared for it. So then they cling to their children or they project anxiety onto their children. So it's a big testing time, that time of going to college where you're really yeah. tested. How much do you trust in your own parenting? How much do you trust in your child? And how much can you allow them to fuck it up, right? They're going to fuck it up. So can you allow it? And can you be okay with it? Well, we fuck up stuff all the time. So we have to have right. grace for their fuck ups, right? I mean, right, that's something right. that I admit to my seven-year-old. I'm like, mommy's not going to always get it right. It's my first time being a mom. It's your first time being a human. Let's do this together. But right. I, did you cry, Dr. Shafali? Be honest. Did you cry? <laughs> you want me to be honest? Okay, I'm going to be honest. Yes! <laughs> They're me you know, you drop your college, me you drop your kid to college many times every semester. So the right. first semester, it was like I was getting released from prison. OK, I was like, <laughs> bye. See ya. I, I mean, of course, I shed a tear or two, but it was not very genuine and not very deep. I was just so ready to be released like I'm the teenager, really. And she was so ready to be released that it was like, bye, see ya. And we both just just escaped from each other. But the <laughs> second time, you know, so the first time was like, oh, woo, I'm free. She was free. Right. I was free. We were so excited. But I think then the second and third time, my goodness, I bawled my eyes out. Like, I was like, what is wrong with me? So I had a delayed reaction. So everyone does it differently. I, I have friends who come home the first time totally basket cases, depressed. 
and then there was me totally like a party girl but you're then, like Woo-hoo! <laughs> right but then it hit me later and i was so grateful because i really thought i was an evil mother who did not really care about her kid i was so happy that i cared uh, but yeah. you know it's an adjustment there's no perfect way to do this it's an adjustment letting go of the identity of being a hands-on mother is a weird process Uh, I can't believe that days I don't hear from my kid. Can you imagine not hearing from your kid for days? So it takes time to adjust. Yeah, exactly. Every 10 minutes, your kid is on your back, right? Mommy, 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 mommy. Yeah, I'm in that phase right now. Yeah. I look forward to it, though. (laughs) So you not only are not needed anymore, but your kid literally doesn't call you back or text you for days. So you have to go through a, a new, I know it's freedom on one hand, but it's strange on the other hand. So you have to adjust, you have to transform. So every stage of childhood brings about its challenges and mm. you just have to keep you know, rising to the challenge. It's a trip, every, every part of parenthood is a trip. I probably, probably will be like you because I, I'm sort of ruled by my head more than my heart. And so I do feel very shackled to this mommyhood thing. And I want us to not feel guilty about that. I really do, because I was a free flowing, free spirited businesswoman. And then a baby comes along. You're like, oh, I work for her now. Oh, and like you were saying, chauffeur, cook, maid, like therapist, like all these jobs all of a sudden that you have for this person that came out of your vagina. And uh, it's just... It's, it's a mind screw, but I'm adjusting as well as I can. And I'm like trying to settle into it. But I had depression right when the pandy, the pandy around five. I was like, am I having postpartum like five years late? Because then I had to be, all the jobs I had, I had to add school teacher. Right. Oh my God. Yes. I want to strangle myself. Yes, and, and have to become their playmate and their friend. Oh. oh my goodness, kill me already. Yes. Because you had an only child as well. That's a whole different paradigm. Because other kids who have siblings, they were stuck at home playing with their sibling. I then had to like soothe her, calm her. Sorry, other kids, we can't go outside. What tips do you have for parents of only children? First biggest thing I will tell you, parenting a solo child, is do not think for a second that the grass is greener on the other side. You know you do. You're like, oh, look at those children out there playing together. You only see when they're playing together. You're not seeing the fighting and the screaming, okay? (laughs) Let me tell you, I too, when my kid was young, coveted the neighbor's band of army of children. I was like, oh, I should have had 17 children also. Oh, wow. So I can leave me alone. Yes, I I wish I was orthodox. I would have had 19 children and they would all take care of each other. Listen to me, it's a fantasy, okay? Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you, now that my daughter's 19, how amazing it is to have only one kid because it ends faster, it's, it's done. Like there's not another trail of 16 more children behind her. I know I'm being brutally honest and, and really mean about it, but listen, it ends faster, but here's the biggest, the two other biggest advantages that we don't realize. Sibling rivalry is a bitch, okay? It is a real thing and it's awful. Now sibling love is amazing and our kids won't have mm-hmm. that. Well, they can have it through friends this mythology Mm -hmm. that our kids are losing out because they don't have siblings is a mythology it is not true your kid will be well adjusted and well socialized and she will have sisters in her best friends my daughter has the bestest friends since second grade and they're sisters okay number three solo children are so much cheaper okay (laughs) listen to me once they go to college, you're going to realize how grateful yes. you are that you only have one tuition to pay for. So be practical. Don't be in your head and fantasize about, oh, I wish my kids loved each other, had siblings who loved each other. No, they can also torment each other. They can bully the hell out of each other and make your life 10 times the living hell. So what I'm trying to say is what you have is what you need 
and all that you need to focus on. Do not covet other family situations. You don't know what is happening. As a therapist, I'm lucky to have seen everything and I don't covet anyone else's life. Nobody mm-hmm. else's life. The rich man's life, the poor man's life, the Turkish man's life, the Chinese man's life. Do not covet anyone else's existence. Just look at what you have and say it is what it is. This is what I have and I'm going to make the best out of what I have. And every situation has abundance and every situation has challenges. But let me tell you, solo children, I'm tell- it feels hard in the beginning, but then as they grow older, it's lovely. It's just lovely mm. and cheaper and cheaper. I'm always <laughs> saying to myself, okay, thank goodness I only have to do this once. Thank goodness I only have to pay for this once. Yes. And they are well adjusted. My daughter is superbly adjusted. Yes. Independent. I love, you know, I only like it when you're brutally honest. That's what we need more in this world. Well, I agree with you a hundred percent. And I've said to her, she's like, why don't I have a brother or sister? I'm like, well, then you'd have to share mommy. And then she Uh thinks and she goes, oh no, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I was like, exactly. You like mommy right where you have her is is completely focused on you. Um, Right. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. This is what we ask all mommies. This is our our quick quiz answer and and test moment. If you had to bring three things to your mommy journey that are non-negotiables, the three things you have, some people say wands, some people say sage, what would be your three things that make your mommy journey poppin'? So they're right here. So the first one is this philosophy that it is what it is. You know, I'm is always, what it I'm is. always accepting the isness of where I am. It is what it is. And then my meditation practice. So this is my symbol of my meditation. And then I think just my, you know, my writing. So my pen, my, my pen, my laptop is right here. This is my expression, my creativity, my, my vehicle to process. I'm a writer. That's what I am at heart. And uh, this is what saves me. I'm always writing a book. I'm writing my next one right now. I always Always. need something to write and whether it's a book or my journal, uh, my thoughts. um, So these are my three things that keep me sane. And I'm so grateful you're a writer because what you did with the Radical Awakening is just profound. The fact that you, you branched into so many different sort of structures in our lives was so brilliant. And I think it's opening people's minds. Like we have no place else to go than to shift right now. So yes. thank you for being such a beacon of that. It is powerful. We've got to expand or we will be no more. So thank you yes. for that. And when you journal, are you, it, are your books in those journals? Um, you know, they are, you know, everything I write about is to help people awaken. So I'm always, you know, writing notes and seeds of ideas are always coming. So yes, it's all about consciousness, awakening, healing, growing, and our big ego and the dissolution of that ego. I love that. Okay, what are the five must-have non-negotiables? What does this say? I'm so blind, I should put my glasses on. With your kids, as far as like rules that you had with your daughter. Oh my goodness. Well, the biggest rule I had was to constantly adapt, right? That was my rule, like enter the moment and adapt. That was my non-negotiable, but I know what you mean. What were your non-negotiables for her? So I think in the beginning, uh, I really minimized screen time because in those Mm. days you could, you didn't have a pocket phone and a pocket this and a pocket that. So in those days, I tried to minimize it as much as possible. Um, my other non-negotiable was just being out in nature, you know, creativity, uh, just, you know, all the positives. It wasn't so much what she couldn't do, but what she could do. Right. So Mm. I tried to fill in, fill in community, friends, play, a lot of play. I really believe in the science of play, the language of play, a lot of playtime, a lot of freedom. You know, I believe childhood is the most sacred time of Mm -hmm. life and sadly in today's over industrialized overproduced culture we are creating childhood to be a mini adulthood and we don't realize that childhood is its own special unique never to be had before again time of life it'll never come again and i really sanctified it I, i know i tried to sanctify it for my child the awe the wonder the innocence the play the freedom of, of expression, 
I, I tried to nurture that. Those were my non-negotiables, you know, keep this beautiful phase of life sacred. So I protected her as much as I could from adulthood. I love that. It's so much harder today with screens everywhere, but I love that. And, and you realize when you're an adult how short childhood is, that oh it should gosh, be cherished. So short. Yeah. Yes, yes. When I have five seconds to myself, now go back to when your daughter was in your house. When I have five seconds to myself, I like to... Oh my goodness. Just kind of stop in my tracks because five seconds is so short, right? Remember those times you're like, oh my God, I have 30 minutes, what can I do? And then you just don't do nothing because you can't, you've you got so many things to do. So I think in those moments, it was just kind of, just let me go and be still and just like yes. eat something and just basic care, like close my eyes or eat something very basic to survive this moment, right? Because you, you're constantly under siege and yeah. privacy is such a rare thing and rest, right? When you're not being interrupted is such a rare thing that I suggest hold still so no one would see me, not even a bird, nobody's <laughs> eyes on me. And you know, I used to love going to CVS. Did you ever love? I used to volunteer. Love. Let me go. I'll go do the shopping. I'll go clean the garbage. I'll go, anything to get out of the house. And then I used to, just when you enter the aisles of CVS or Walgreens or Walmart, you're like, let me live here forever, please. Yes. You know, you just don't <laughs> want to be found. You just want to look at you know, medicine and magazines and never be found again. So escaping was my thing, you know, how can yeah. I escape? You know, I, I've been the same. I mean, when I have long, I'm, I co-parent with her father, but when I have long runs where he's no, he's working, he's too busy, there's a football game on and it falls on me, of course. And then he finally takes her. I find myself just in silence, staring yeah. at a wall, Yeah, just yeah just yes. to have silence and then yes. i go i wasn't productive today and then i have guilt but just quiet i'm so yes. right there with you it's unreal how beautiful yes. that is yeah yes I, i'm gonna move on to my greatest mommy hack is and you have billions but what's the one that's coming to mind right now my greatest mommy hack is don't yell and scream you know why not because you, you shouldn't but because you will pay back for the next 24 days, you know? <laughs> Control the yelling and the screaming because the guilt that comes to you later is not worth that five minute explosion. So yeah. the biggest hack I've learned is shut up, is just be quiet, walk away. And as profoundly spiritual as that sounds, I didn't do it for spiritual reasons. I did it for survival reasons because then I would have to deal with the guilt and then make it up to her and then deal with the tears, which lasts for days. So I just learned, you know what? Forget what the Buddha said. The Buddha said to be non-reactive for a beautiful reason. I'm just going to do it because it's smart. It's just smart to not open your mouth. Keep it shut. You know, do less, talk less, and walk away. And then at least you have an added to the trauma. It's amazing because this is reminding me of when I had you on the set of Extra. And I said to you off camera, I'm like, Dr. Shafali, what do I do when my daughter's being an asshole? And you go, you don't be an asshole and your daughter won't be an asshole. And I will no. never forget it for the rest of my life. And that's exactly what it is. We have right. to react the way we want them to reflect us. And sometimes when they're melting down, silence. Yeah. And maybe they'll find silence too. And we can yeah. have Just calmer walk away. Walk yeah. away. As soon as you're, as so, I tell parents, as soon as your kid is legit safe or put them in a you know container, whatever, walk away because you will save so much trouble later. And we don't realize that, you know, we think we should stick around, we'll convince them, we'll cajole them, we'll yell at them. It's always making it worse. Walking yeah. away always makes it better. So once you learn that through punishment, through the hard way, then you just go, oh my God, let me walk away. It's so smart to walk away, you know? It you're is. Losing, and then go winning. Yeah. Go scream in a pillow somewhere in yes, the other room yes, <laughs> would yes. help a lot better. Yes, yes, when I, yes. When I was pregnant, why didn't they tell me that it would be a bankruptcy in the making, that it would be a body that will never reverse back, that it will be no sex, fat, you'll be fatter, you'll be angrier, not that fat is bad, but you'll just be an angry hot mess. And then that it lasts for freaking forever. It's forever. Yeah. I mean, no one, they may have said it, but they didn't highlight it. No. Yeah. 
<laughs> they make it so it's so wonderful. I, that's what I say all the time on Mama's Day is that I read all these baby books, tossed them in the trash because I felt like they were so not real. They were yes. such crap. And then seven months pregnant. Hallelujah. I see you with Oprah under the oak trees and my whole world changed. And I was like, okay, I can do this. I can do yeah. this. So thank you, know, you we, for we, that. We have to first be honest. You know, we're all pretending that it's a bed of roses. And then we're all silently suffering in shame yeah. with embarrassment because it's not a bed of roses. But if we didn't have the setup that it should be perfection or should be amazing, then we'll all get real with each other and just then we can be warriors together. But if we mm. have this idea that it should be something that it's never going to be, then we're all embarrassed and guilty and shameful, you know, and then, then we don't share. Yeah, we set ourselves up for failure. We got to stop yes. doing that. OK, yes. I couldn't. OK, I'm going to skip one. My village is because you, you I know you were you yes. were married and then you got divorced, but you can't mm -hmm. do it all by yourself. You're you're busy writing books and touring and having these events. My village is who's in it? My village is my my dear female friends who are equally sloppy at parenting, equally trying to escape it, and just real people, you know, who I can get together with and just say, you know, oh my goodness, shoot me in the eyes if I ever say I want to have another child, you know, who I can be honest with. Those are my tribe. And when yes. you have that, and I have it, I'm sure you do too, when you have that close group of female friends, they are who are going to get you through this. There's no man in the world who can understand what it is to be a mother. And, uh, you know, mothers are just different. We're a different breed. Fathers are a different breed. And only fathers can understand other fathers, perhaps. But we need our female friends, our female sisters to kind of count on. And, and that's what we need to be with each other and stop raising the bar. We need to destroy the bar. And when we crush yes. the bar, then we can all just be human together. Love that. And yes, my daughter has not godparents, so to speak, because we're not of that religion, but we do aunties, multiple yes. aunties that have her yes. back. And we yes. are able to create our chosen family that way, yes. which is Absolutely. almost more profound. Yes. What is your favorite guilty pleasure? Uh, my favorite guilty pleasure is just, you know, food, wine, going out with friends, travel. It's not, I don't even feel guilty about it. So let me think of something I feel guilty about. <laughs> Are um, you watching trashy reality shows on the side? Oh, oh, like that, like that. Oh, yeah, I could, I could, I could. Yeah, I've all, I already have a list of guilty things to do when I'm, you know, ill. The next time I'm ill, all my trashy <laughs> shows. But yeah, I'm not above anything. I, I, I tend to be... Uh, you know, someone who just has, I'm done with guilt. You know, I'm just done with it. There's nothing I really feel guilty about, yeah. except if I was unconscious with my child. That would be the only thing I would even feel guilt about. Everything else, I'm just, you know, learning to have compassion, allow, accept. I'm going to be 50 this year. I don't have time to be guilty anymore, you know? I love that. And I didn't know we were the same age. Yeah, <laughs> I always, 49 I right now, yes. Yes, Mama. Yeah, we look damn good. Hello. I love we that. Do. And I love the fact that you said, you know what? There's no time. There's We don't have time to be guilty about anything. Screw that. Own yes. it. I love you for yes. that. Yes. Um, your fave thing to do with your daughter when she's back from school. Oh, my goodness. If I'm allowed to even be in her presence, I'll be grateful, <laughs> you know. It's it, like licking crumbs, you know, when she allows you to drive her somewhere or she allows you to enter her room. You'll see when they become older, you are you are very privileged if they even look at you. So, yeah, I, I'll take anything with my daughter, you know, when she comes out for dinner with me or I'll take any any time. So it's not the favorite thing I want to do with my daughter. It's what she allows me. But but she does allow me one thing, even though she's 19. We do sleep together many times in the same bed and she'll allow me to to put her to bed and I get to be mommy again. So yeah, that's I my favorite love thing. That. When, when she allows me, she has pity on me and says, okay, okay, you can be my mom. I love that. We love that, you know, as much we as it's love so that. exhausting, that's what we live for, you know? Yeah. 
She's going to one day turn to you and be like, oh, my God, you're the most amazing mother in the world. Yes, but I've warned her I'm not taking care of her children. You know how they are. (laughs) That's when they will suddenly want you and remember you. When they have children and they can't cope, I'm going to go live somewhere far away. I don't I'm I'm not one of those. I'm going to be a grandmother. No. Oh, you're speaking big game now. You're speaking Uh, big talk now. You're going to. Let's see. Let's see. Hopefully you have some time. (laughs) Yes, I hope. I hope. Yes. Okay. This is flipping the script a little bit. What is the greatest thing you've learned from from your daughter? Oh, my God. The entire conscious parenting has emerged from her indomitable spirit. If I had a compliant, easy-go-lucky, you know, sweet little innocent, kind, kind-hearted kid and not this huge, you know, powerhouse of a, you know, brat sometimes, I would never, never do conscious parenting. I had to succumb to the indomitable presence of this young person. She was like your child, huge presence would not say okay to me, would not Mm -hmm. smile if she did not want to smile. This I'm talking Mm -hmm. at the age of two or three. So I was blessed with this this creature that I couldn't control. And that was the best thing that happened to me. And that's how conscious parenting even emerged because I couldn't control her spirit. And that was the best thing for me. So my ego of wanting to control her had to be destroyed. It was either I destroy her which I was trying desperately to do, but I was not <laughs> cheating, or I destroy my ego. And she was so strong that I had no choice but to destroy my own ego. She didn't even give you the, an option. Yeah, She didn't even give me an option. But that was the best thing because that's how this whole philosophy came about. God bless her. I got to say, God when they her. say, yes, God bless your daughter. When they say kids are um, well-behaved, that means their spirit is dying a little bit. And I've, I've never forgotten that, right? hundred percent if I get scared when somebody says my kid was the perfect kid because there's no such thing you have the perfectly conditioned kid but you do, you can no human being is perfect so the fact that they're perfect means that they are validating your tyranny or they're validating your oppression mm. you know and and no parent really should get away with a perfect kid. I mean, every parent of perfect kids should come to parent school and they should be asked, what are you doing to your kid that is making them so compliant, right? Yeah, that kind of scares me too. I go, oh, you're you're gonna see the the repercussions of that later on. And I, my my goal, and I've said this to my, you know, I haven't said this to my daughter, but is to do the hard work now so that she's not in, Therapy, even though I think therapy is everything and amazing and it saved my life, I'm just trying to get her past 18 before she feels like she needs therapy, right? Just past 18. After that, I feel like I'm, I'm successful. Yes, I agree. You know, my daughter's, when my daughter turned 18, I literally cried because I got her to that threshold. <laughs> but then the next set of challenges comes, right? So it never ends. But you're right. There are these developmental phases that we just want to get them across and you're 100% correct. There is not a perfect compliant kid that I have met who did not crack one day or the other. So we don't want to put the burden of perfection on our children. We want them to experience their normalcy, their ordinariness, their averageness. Let your mm-hmm. kids be average so that then they can rise up the ladder. But if you place them on top of the ladder and hold a gun to them and tell them they have to stay up there, then they have only downward to go, right? So we want our kids to suffer, to fail, to be average, and to be okay in their ordinariness, not make them feel like they are perfect and that's how they get their validity because then they're going to fall. I see it all the time. All the time. My family needs to probably, my whole family probably needs to come and have a session with you because (laughs) lots of type A, OCD, you know, successful people is a really hard family to grow up in. I'm going to, I'm going to expand this a little bit in the time that we have left to from mothers to mother earth. Um, because I had you and I had Deepak and I've had some other thought leaders, Joseph uh, McClendon, who you guys are my people, right? And I've talked to you, talked to Deepak about our world. At the time, it was pre-pandemic. 
I go, what is going on with our world? It seems like it's on fire. And he said, it's about to get worse. Um, and that this world that we're living in is just a reflection of us. Now, what the hardest thing for me to, to get into my head is collectively, we have to shift to make a better world. We all, now I can work on myself, you can work on yourself, but as a collective, we have to shift. Well, that seems really like a really uphill climb. How do you see humanity and what is the greatest thing that we can do to help shift collectively? Because we need it desperately right now. Yeah, we're not going to shift collectively in any momentous way that is going to save our earth. We have caused indestructible permanent damage in the last 30 years because of our insatiable, out of control, even more obsessive desire for capitalist supremacy. So we have destroyed it. We are already at the bottom of the hill on the other side. So I say this as a fact, uh, you know, and not even with any emotion because it is what it is. So it is a reflection of our deep and increasing disconnection to our soul, to ourself, whatever you want to call it, to nature, to each other. We, you, you're seeing it with your, our children's addiction to screens. Who mm -hmm. did that? Our generation did that. We have destroyed the earth. End of story. Now we live with that consequence, you know, and mm -hmm. sure, one can awaken here, two can awaken there. But the degree to which we are addicted to technology and therefore the destruction we are experiencing needs to be offset with that much or even greater, uh, you know, love for the earth. How are we going to do that? We, this is not increasing, but our technological obsession and desire for capitalist supremacy, that is increasing. That's exponentially increasing, logarithmically increasing. So how can we combat that? So, you know, the only way to combat that is for our ego on a global level to come into check. That will require global consensus. We cannot even agree in a family whether to wear masks or not. So it's not going to happen. So instead yeah. of painting, oh, a hopeful, optimistic picture, which is completely unrealistic, we just need to accept that we are unconscious right now and this is the effects of unconsciousness. And this has been in place for the past 100 years, but definitely the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. And this is now the fruits of that destruction. So, you know, there's no escaping reality. People like to cover it up in beauty or, you know, oh, we're going to the moon or, you know, oh, Ugh. we have, you know, but we're not. We're destroying the moon. Now we're going to destroy another planet. And people don't they talk about the that. moon, the metaverse, the moon, just all these places to go to. I'm like, they're already gang raping women in the metaverse. We, if we can't figure that out here, why are we going to a fantasy land on the... Co it's insanity what we're going through. So, so last question, because I love you. Are you, and I need to know, are you disconnecting? Because I believe in disconnection, detachment. Are you in a certain sense detaching yourself? from what's happening in order to, as an empathic person, this is a lot, it's a lot to take every single day. Is there an amount of detachment that gets you through the day? Yeah, but detachment is, is uh, a very active word. It's not passive avoidance. Yes. Detachment means to, as I do it and practice it, means to understand human nature and the nature of greed, uh, lack, unworthiness. And what we're seeing is a reflection of greed, lack, and unworthiness, which then results in an obsessive desire for power. You're seeing it mm -hmm. in Ukraine right now. You're Absolutely. seeing it in Somalia, you're seeing it in Africa, everywhere. You're seeing it here in America. So I am detaching from the attachment that it should be other than what it is because human nature is filled with ego. Mm. So I'm detaching from the expectation or the hope or the passive desire for it to be other than what it is. I am detaching from the illusion that it is other than what it is. So detachment is a very powerful active process. It's not passive mm -hmm. avoidance. It is wisdom to understand human nature. And when you understand human nature, 
you detach from expectation. It's just like you detach from owning your children because you cannot own your children. So when you have wisdom, with that comes a very healthy process of detachment, but it is not passive and it's not avoidance. I'm actively engaged in life with the awareness that I need to be detached from any delusional ideas of perfection or outcome that is hopeful. <laughs> I'm seeing it as it is, right? So there's no hiding in detachment, this active process of detachment. So people don't understand typically what detachment means. They just go, hey, I'm going to check out. Right, right, right. The... I'm going to smoke yeah, something. That... I'm going to drink something. No, yeah, that, that's just avoidance. Yeah. yeah. Well, whew, you, that just landed hard because you're right. It goes right back to your little frame. It is what it is. And mm -hmm. once we can get down to the truth and accept it is what it is, but still mm -hmm. glow and light up the world and illuminate and stick and, and be obedient to God's gifts. Mm -hmm. That's all we have control over, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been lovely talking to you as always. I'm so proud of you for all that you're doing. You're so thank brave you. and, and thank you for supporting me as well. So I'm very honored to be here. Always. I love you dearly. You're so incredible. Just keep writing and keep shining a light on all of the places that we need to shift, all the places we need to re-examine because we've all been conditioned. We can do better. Kind of figure out what your real thoughts are, not what you've been mm -hmm. told to believe. You mm -hmm. are queen, Dr. Shafali. Thank you so much for being with us here on Mama Stay with Tanika Ray. This show would be nothing without mm -hmm. you and your contributions. So right. thank you. Big thank cuddle. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out, Mama. I know how little time we have in our day to honor ourselves, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. Make sure you click like, rate, and subscribe. I'd love to hear what you think about today's show and what you want to hear going forward. Remember, mommying is a gift, and you're doing a kick-ass job. So, woosah, and mama stay. <laughs>